So today's main topic is logarithms. And we want to understand the general case. What is log base B of X for an arbitrary base B? We do need to assume the input for this function, and it is a function, X is positive. We also need to assume B is bigger than zero and not equal to one. We'll talk about why you don't want it to equal one. But what is this? This is the unique, maybe you didn't put the word unique when you tried this, the unique number such that when you raise b to this power, you get x. I'll say to which b must be raised to get x. Kind of a long-winded description, but it is accurate. It's the unique, this entire symbol. This is one number when X is some fixed positive number and B is some fixed positive number not equal to one, it's the unique number to which B must be raised, it's a power, to get X. It's a power, it's an exponent. Therefore, in other words, a symbolic way to write that, three dots like that means therefore, B raised to that power b to the log base b of x power is x by definition. Now, you might wonder, how do I know there's a unique number to which b must be raised to get x? That is a, a good and important question. Let's take some examples before we consider that question in depth. Let's Consider, for example, log base two of 32. What is that equal? Tell me fast. Right. Yeah, what? Okay, somebody said the answer. The answer is five. Yeah, you said, what power should I raise two to to get 32? This equals five since two to the fifth power is 32. Five is the unique number that two must be raised to to get 32. Therefore, log base two of 32 is five. Log base two of one thirty second. Yikes. It's actually easy though. What is it? Negative five. Why? Since two to the negative five is one thirty second, not just because your calculator says it is, but better because when you raise a number to a negative power, by definition, that means one divided by that same number to the corresponding positive power. That's what negative powers mean. Why do they mean that? because it turns out to be convenient and it is consistent with, for example, laws of exponents. I won't go into details. It is a good idea that this two to the negative five power means this. Two to the fifth power is 32, right? Because it's, it's two times two times two times two times two, and that is 32. Log base, four of two. This is a little trickier. What number must four be raised to to get two? Is that possible? One half, yes. Since four to the one half power by definition is the square root of four, that's what one half power means. Why? Because it makes Laws of exponents consistent. It's a good idea. It's really a definition. It's nothing, nothing to prove there. It's a definition of what ha one half power means. Square root of four is the, well, the, the square root symbol means positive square root. 
It's the positive number whose square is four, which is two. One half is the power, the unique power, the unique exponent to which four must be raised to get two. Likewise, log base four of one half is negative one half. Since four to the negative one half by definition is one over four to the positive one half, which is one over the square root of four, which is one half. Weird, but true. Log base 10 is also called the common logarithm. And if you just write LOG without a base, it means log base 10, but I wrote a 10 there anyway. Is commonly used with, for example, powers of 10, 10 to the seventh power, which is 10 million. What power must 10 be raised to to get 10 to the seventh power? Uh, I guess seven? Yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Not really, but yeah, it's sense. 10 to the seventh equals 10 to the seventh. Really, that's the reason. And yes, this can be written just as a plain old log of 10 to the seventh. Common logarithm doesn't require you to write a base. On a calculator, it's the LOG button, log, log, 10 to the seventh. I could type 10 to the seventh in there and get seven. I also could type, oops, L-O-G, 10 million, 10, one, two, three, one, two, three, 10 million, seven. Log, base 10, I'm not gonna write the base, of 0 In scientific notation, that's 10 to the negative what? Let's see, I'd have to move the decimal place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spots to get it just to the right of the one. That's 10 to the negative eight. Another way to think of it is if you put a zero in front of the decimal and then your other zeros, there are eight zeros total there. As long as you put the zero in front of the decimal too. Oh, that's negative eight. Confirm it, log, okay, I'm not gonna put the zero in front, so I'll just put seven zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. I should get negative eight. Yep. That's the common logarithm. More importantly for calculus, there's the natural logarithm, log base E. Uh, for example, 10, written ln of 10, ln is the standard notation for log base E. In French, although I'll mangle the pronunciation, it's log natural, log natural, something like that. Natural logarithm. What power must I raise E to to get 10? Well, um, I don't know. Calculator, what's the answer? LN10, about 2.30258.5093. LN of 10, and this approximation, this is gonna be an irrational number, is about 2.30258.5093. Why, since e to that power Sorry, e to that power, 2.30258.5093, well, is approximately 10. It's not exactly 10 because I haven't, it's an infinite decimal that goes on forever without a repeating pattern. I mean, if I do this on my calculator, if I go second function e and take the previous answer, it's going to give me 10 because it's keeping more decimal places of accuracy. 
But certainly if I do e to the 2.302585, it's not going to give me exactly 10. And if I do e to the 2.302585093, it still may not give me exactly 10, or maybe it does. Okay, it's it's rounding, but it's rounding to 10. In reality, this is an irrational number that goes on forever without a repeating pattern. We're just looking at the first, what, three, six, nine, 10 digits, significant digits. Good enough for most applications. Should bring up a question in your mind though. It's an irrational number, goes on forever and ever. How, how do we know there is such a number? You ever think about that? How do we know if it's a repeating, if it's an irrational number, it's a non-repeating decimal going on forever and ever? Nobody but God knows all the digits. It's impossible, right? It's infinitely many non-repeating digits. How do you know there is such a number? Euler said so. I'm not going to answer that question completely. I will try to partially answer it, not today. Well, maybe I'll hint at it today. But it's a big question. That's an approximation, but you can find exact answers for things like this. Oh, let's do something weird. How about natural log of e to the pi? It's pi. What number do you need to raise e to to get e to the pi? Since e to the pi is e to the pi, that really is the reason. You don't believe me? Calculator, approximately what is e to the pi? It's approximately 23.14069263. What's the natural log of that number? Should be about 3.14. Yeah, 3.14592654. By the way, I'm a math professor in my 50s. And I've never bothered memorizing pi past 3.14159. I probably couldn't have tell, told you the next digit was two. I'm serious. It just doesn't interest me. Okay, but if it interests you, I'm glad, okay? I mean, I like the fact that it's an irrational number that's not a repeating decimal. I, I like finding the digits, but I don't bother memorizing them. I just happen to go up to the nine. Now, it's just, that, that does stick in my memory. Okay, math is not about memorization, though it is good to memorize things sometimes for the sake of a test, at least. Okay. And it can help long-term memory, too. So I'm not saying memorization is bad. I think it can be good, but it's certainly not the end-all, be-all. Do something else weird. What's ln of e to the... Negative 17.4. Well, it's negative 17.4. What's ln of e to the square root of 2? It's square root of 2. Hmm. Are we seeing a pattern here? What we're seeing in some of these examples is that if you've got log base b, of b to the x, you get x. Yeah, that's the definition. What number do you need to raise b to to get b to the x? x. b to the x is b to the x. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is by definition. Also by definition, if I take b and raise it to the log base b of x power, that also gives me x by definition. Both of those are true by definition. This one's more directly true based on what we described. Log base b of x is the number to raise b to to get x. So if I take b and raise it to that number, I got to get x. This one Log base b of b to the x is the number I got to raise b to to get b to the x. x.
We didn't really emphasize this with the inverse functions last week. But this is illustrating that b to the x and b log base b of x are inverse functions. If I let f of x equal b to the x, where once again b is positive and not equal to 1, why shouldn't it be equal 1? Because if b were 1, it'd be 1 to the x. And 1 to the x is always 1. It's not really an exponential function. It's a constant function. Its graph is horizontal. And it fails to be one-to-one. -one. It's got no inverse function. That's why we don't want b to equal one. If b is positive, the graph of b to the x looks like this. It's increasing in concave up. It's one-to-one, -one. it passes the horizontal line test. No horizontal line goes through it more than once. Therefore, if I reflect it across the line y equals x, if you need to turn your paper this way to help you do it accurately, I'll get a graph like that, that'll pass the vertical line test. No vertical line will go through it more than once, and so it'll be the graph of a function. This is y equals b to the x. This is y equals the inverse function of b to the x, which is going to exist, and it is log base b of x. Log base b of x is just the name of the inverse function. It's a weird name. Developed by Napier in the 1600s or something logarithms, why logarithms, I don't know. Maybe I looked it up once. It's kind of fun. It's kind of a fun name. Uh-huh. You could be right. I don't know. Actually, people knew about logarithms long before Napier, a couple thousand years ago, though they, they didn't call them logarithms. They knew about finding exponents, though they didn't call them exponents. So it's it's all kind of weird, but that's the inverse function. It's got a graph that's increasing and concave down when B is bigger than one. If B is, oh, you know, I made a mistake here. B is bigger than one, not bigger than zero. If B is between zero and one, it's really exponential decay graph looks like this, decreasing the concave up. Still one-to-one, -one, though. Past the horizontal line test, we can still reflect it across that line. It's a little trickier. Uh, looks like this, if you're careful. And so when b is between 0 and 1, this is y equals b to the x. And this one, I should have made the other one in green. This one's log base b of x when b is between 0 and 1. Now, we hardly ever talk about logarithms where the base is between 0 and 1. That, that's just hardly ever done. The most common bases to use, although I shouldn't maybe use the word common, are 10 for the common logarithm, e for the natural logarithm, and 2 is used a lot in computer science because of binary digits and stuff. Okay, those are the most commonly used bases for logarithms. Hardly anybody ever uses a base where it's between zero and one. But if you did, that's what the graph would look like. Certainly we use, do use exponential decay functions for applications. And you should realize, and somebody asked me about this over the weekend, that this exponential function, for example, exponential decay function, 2 to the negative x, by a property of exponents, a couple properties of exponents, is the same as 1 half to the x. <clears throat> That's an exponential decay because of the, of the 2 being bigger than 1 and the negative x up there, but it is the same as 1 half to the positive x. Though when I say positive x, realize x could be a negative number. I just mean there's no negative sign up there. These are the same functions, two different ways of writing the same function. 
What are logarithms good for? They're good for, as you maybe you thought about a little bit last week, solving exponential equations. Has anybody ever heard of the rule of 72? Anybody? One person there, anybody else? It's important, somebody back there. Rule of 72 is important for quick estimates in finance. Rule of 72, it's sometimes called the rule of 70, but I think the rule of 72 works better. That if you've got an investment that grows at a certain percent per year, you can figure out how long it's gonna to take to double. And what you do is you take 72 and you divide it by the interest rate or the, the growth fact, the growth rate. For example, if it's an 8% interest rate, the doubling time is approximately 72 divided by eight, nine years, say, if the interest is in percent per year. I'd be assuming 8% is per year. Uh, if it's 9% per year, then the doubling time is approximately 72 divided by nine, uh, which is eight years. How could you confirm this? You could for, confirm, for example, that 1.09 representing 9% growth per year raised to the eighth power is close to two, 1.99. 1.08 to the ninth power is also close to two, 1.999. Yeah, actually the rule of 72 works the best when your interest rate is near 8%. Once your interest rate gets further away from 8%, like say 2%, it doesn't work so well. 72 divided by two is 36. 1.02 to the 36th power is not quite as close to two. 2.04, that's still reasonably close to two. Okay, quick description of the rule of 72. To find the exact doubling times, you can use logarithms. We thought about that some last week. 1.08, let me use the t power for time. So the t power equals two. How do you solve for t exactly? Take the log of both sides. But wait a minute, which log? Well, you want to use your calculator, so you use either natural log or log base 10, common log then. In calculus, we almost always use natural log, log base E, because it turns out to be best for calculus. The reason is mysterious at the moment. Why should log base E be best for calculus when E is this weird number, 2.71828, and it, I remember that far for E, and no further because it's irrational, not repeating decimal, though it looks like it's repeating at first. E, that looks like it's repeating, right? 1828, 1828. Uh, it's just calculator accuracy. If you keep going, it doesn't repeat anymore. E is irrational too. Anyway, we'll get in the habit of using log base E, I think. Take the log of both sides. and solve for t, huh? How? <clears throat> Shouldn't we use log base 1.08 instead of log base e? If this were a log base 1.08, then that would simplify to just a t. t would equal log point of one point, log base 1.08 of two. But that just begs the question, how do you find that without a calculator? since there's no log base 1.08 power in your calculator. Well, here's the magic. This exponent, t, can be brought in front, even though it's natural log, not log base 1.08. But it doesn't simplify to t, it simplifies to t times natural log of 1.08. 
But that's good still, because now to solve for t, I can just divide both sides by this. T is natural log of two divided by natural log of 1.08. Now I can use my calculator. ln of two divided by ln of 1.08. About, yeah, real close to nine, 9.006. Nine that rule of 72 is pretty close. 72 divided by eight is nine. The true answer is close to 9.006, very close to nine. If I had had some other coefficient in front of the 1.08, like a, a five times 1.08, I'd want to divide by five before I take the log. What would have happened if I had done the common logarithm instead of the natural logarithm? I would have gotten the same answer, though it would have looked different. But it would have been the same final answer. Log of two divided by log of 1.08 is the same number. The individual numbers in the top and the bottom of the fraction are different, but the fraction itself is the same. The ratio of the two numbers is the same in both cases. Make sense? But why can we do this? Why can we bring that T down in front? That's an example of an abstract property of logarithms, three of which I'm about to write down. Laws of logarithms, laws of logs. Actually, two of them we've already written down. These two right here. By the way, you should get used to thinking about the domains on which these equations are true. This one's true only when x is positive. But this one's actually true for all x, even if x is negative. How can that be if I'm only allowed to plug positive numbers into logarithms? Well, even if x is negative, b to the x is positive. That's why. Right? X, b to the x has a graph that's always above the horizontal axis. The output's always positive, no matter what x is, even if x is negative. So these are effectively a couple laws of logs. And by the way, these, I forgot to mention back here, these equations could be thought of in terms of inverse functions notation. Going back up here, this one is F inverse of F of X. And this one is F of F inverse of X. Those are called function compositions which I did want to talk about last week, but I didn't have time for, even in the problem solving videos. That's function composition, sometimes denoted with a circle. This is F inverse circle F of X. That circle is called a function composition operator. It's like a plus sign or a time sign or a division. It's, it's like an arithmetic symbol, just a circle. It does mean something different than adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing. It means plug one function into the other. It's not something to worry about too much. These equations are illustrating that these are inverse functions. I forgot to mention that. Laws of logs, besides the one we wrote down, ones we wrote down, First one is if X and Y are positive, and once again, we're assuming B is positive and not equal to one, then the log base B of the product X times Y is the sum of the individual logarithms. Log base B of X times Y is log base b of x plus log base b of y. The log of a product is the sum of the logs. Say that to yourself over and over again tonight as you go to sleep. You know, it'll help put you to sleep. Log of a product is the sum of the logs. 
People get this mixed up all the time. Wait, is it the log? Is it the log? The sum is the product of the log? No, no, it's the log of a product is the sum of the logs. You should try to memorize this, even though I, you know, I was talking about memorization not being the most important thing in the world. Yeah, and again, certainly it's not the most important thing in the world, but it is still worthwhile sometimes. A similar property is if X and Y are positive, then the log of a quotient X divided by Y, the fraction X divided by Y, the log of the quotient is the difference of the logs, the log of the top minus the log of the bottom. Third property applies to bringing that power down in front. Question? No, they're, they're positive. There is a minus sign there, though. Third property is if X itself is positive, and let's say P is any number, any real number, I'll just call it a number, then the log base B of X to the P power, that P power can be brought down in front. This is P times log base B of X. If you're forgetting these, what's a quick way to try to remember them? It's probably best to think about simple examples. Oh, for example, common log of 10 to the third times 10 to the fourth is the common log of 10 to the third plus the common logarithm of 10 to the fourth is three plus four is seven. And by properties of exponents, this is log of 10 to the seventh. I can add those two exponents, which does equal seven. We've confirmed it. Thinking about examples like that can help you remember, for example, property one if you forget it. However, this example is not a proof of property one. It's an example that helps you remember it. It illustrates the property. Though it does hint at a proof, it's got to be related to the fact that uh, 7 is 3 plus 4. It's got to be related to that. A property of exponents. Mm -hmm. Let's prove property one right now. Do we do a ton of proofs in calculus? I wouldn't call it a ton, but we do do some. You might say, hey, I'm not a math major. And that's true for most of you. Most of you are not math majors. Probably only, I think, two or three or four of you are math majors. But it's still good to work at learning how to do proofs. For one thing, so that the rest of you who are not math majors are aware of the nature of mathematics and how things are verified. That's one good reason to do some proofs in a calculus class. Another good reason is because we should give reasons for some things and not just pretend all of math is magic. Another reason is it is good practice for your life. Maybe if you're gonna homeschool, maybe on the job, you're trying to use logic to convince your boss that you should get a raise. or you're doing apologetics and you're trying to defend your faith. Okay, there's lots of good reasons to learn how to prove things logically using laws of logic, though the validity of your argument is not just based on the laws of logic, but also your assumptions. Let's do a proof of law number one. 
Proofs are arguments, so they should be written in sentences. Ugh. Sentences? Seriously? Yeah. Now, you might have a teacher who had you, in, especially in geometry class, do like a statement, reason, chart, proof. That's nice for learning, but it's really not a proof. Proofs are arguments. They should be written in sentences with explanations. Now, you can write equations in your sentences, and I'm fine with you writing abbreviations and symbols and that kind of thing to help save your tired arm. Save my tired arm. Save some time. But they should be written in sentences. Reasons for things. I'm going to go ahead and just sort of do the proof from scratch right away. Well, I shouldn't even say from scratch. A nice proof right away. But you should also realize that when people are trying to come up with proofs, they usually can't figure them out right away. It usually takes a lot of scratch work and problem solving to figure out how to write a proof. So realize that I've had a lot of practice with this. So that's why I can write a nice proof right away. Okay? Doesn't mean you would be able to write it right away. Though with practice, you can. And at least for this in-person section, I might have you do a proof like this for one of these laws on the exam. I have done that in the past. So what's a proof of law one? This equation right there. Huh. Um, where do you start? It's relating logarithms. I guess you got to use the definition of a logarithm. That must be relevant, right? It can't not be relevant. So maybe that's a good starting place. What do each of these three quantities, these symbols, that one, that one, and that one mean? They are numbers to which B must be raised to get certain things. Oh, go ahead and write that down. By definition, I'll abbreviate, def means definition of logs. I won't put a period there, but it is an abbreviation for logarithms. B to the log base B of X times Y is X times Y. Do you need to put the dot in there for the multiplication? No, but it's not, it doesn't hurt. You can just write X, Y, it means X times Y. Uh, B to the log base B of X equals X. And B to the log base B of Y equals Y. Fun, fun, fun. Uh, Okay, what do you do after that? Now ask yourself, what are you trying to show? You're trying to show that this logarithm equals the sum of these two logarithms. You're trying to show that this number right there in that exponent is the sum of these two exponents. Hmm, not clear what to do. Sometimes you got to do some scratch work to try to figure it out. I did hint that the reason must be related to the fact that when you go from here to here, you add the exponents. Add, yeah, add exponents. These, these are exponents that are being added here. I think we're onto something. Exponents that in this equation are being added. Um, 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 um. What should I write? What should I write? How about by a property of exponents? Uh, B to the, let's go ahead and add these exponents, those two. B to the log base B of X plus log base B of Y. Boy, this is really getting messy. That's just the sum of two numbers in that exponent though. That's B to the log base B of X times B to the log base B of Y, right? That's property of exponents. Usually you go the other way from right to left here. You would add the exponents to go from here to here. You can go back the other way too. Equals is symmetric. Doesn't matter which side things are on. And well, are we closer? Does this help? Well, wait a minute. What's this? this that's X. And that's Y. And that is 
that whole, I feel like we're onto something significant here. Does this do it? Does this show those exponents are the same? Yeah, it does. B to these seemingly two different exponents are equal. Therefore, the exponents must be equal. Done. Okay, I'm using something else there without saying it. I am using the fact that b to a power as a function of that power, b to the x power, say, is a one-to-one -one function. I am using that fact. Okay, uh, maybe I should use a different letter, though. Since b to the what letter should I use? I, I want to use something other than x because I'm already using x. b to the z power. By the way, mathematicians always put little lines to their z's because otherwise they can look like twos. When I was young, I didn't put little lines through my Z's because I didn't care. But then I became a mathematician and yeah, then they can look like twos if you don't put little lines through them. Since B to the Z is a one-to-one -one function of Z, what Z? Uh, it's just a variable. Really up here, I'm thinking of X, Y, and B is all fixed. Here, I'm thinking of Z as a variable. I, I didn't have to call it Z. I could have called it Q or something like that. Doesn't matter. It's the idea. This means that since these two outputs are the same, the inputs must be the same. The powers must be the same. Log base B of X plus log base B of Y equals log base B of X times Y. And that's what we wanted to prove. We're done. When mathematicians finish proofs, they celebrate by write, uh, talking in Latin and writing QED for quad erat demonstrandum. Latin for, I'm done. I demonstrated what I wanted to demonstrate. Quad erat demonstrandum. I might be pronouncing that wrong. As a Christian mathematician, we can also write PTL, praise the Lord. Right, PTL. Okay, got to have some sort of little celebration there. We did what we wanted to do. There is a proof of law number one. Mathematicians look at that and say, fun. Wasn't that cool? Most people, other people say, yeah. Not so fun. But I hope you believe me if you think that, that if you work at this enough and you understand it, it actually does become more fun. And you can you can figure out the proofs of these other ones, and they're not that much different. I encourage you to try. And yes, I have put these on exams before, so you should try, actually. Sometimes on exams, I pick something specific for B, like 10 or E or 2. But it's the same kind of argument. If B was two, then all those Bs would be twos. The X and Y are still arbitrary positive numbers, though. Of course, don't pretend like you can do this without practicing. Right? 99.999% of people cannot then now learning this past 10 minutes reproduce what I just did on a test two weeks from now. You got to practice if you're going to understand and be able to do it. But this is the structure. That's the basic idea of the, the structure. You use the definition of logs and you always use properties of exponents. These properties of logs always correspond to properties of exponents. In our last 10 minutes, we should... Spend some time, I think, hinting at some calculus ideas. So far, we really haven't done calculus. Now we should start hinting at where we're going. In particular, I'm thinking about the idea of limits. And then limits ultimately lead to derivatives and integrals. Derivatives and integrals being the main subjects of calculus, okay? First of all, limit notation 
in the context of the functions we've been considering so far. Some of the functions at least, and maybe a few others. Let's take a, your simple quadratic function x squared. Okay. Let me write the symbol LIM standing for limit x arrow infinity of x squared. Red, the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared. What does this equal or does it not equal anything? This is confusing for pretty much everybody. I'm going to go ahead and write equals infinity, even though infinity is not a number. Oh. When I write that, and I say infinity is not a number, realize then that this equal sign is not a literal equal sign. Oh, is Dr. Kinney being serious? I am being serious, completely serious. Here's how to interpret this. All this is is shorthand, shorthand notation, convenient shorthand notation for the fact that the graph of x squared goes up forever and ever without a horizontal asymptote as x goes to the right forever and ever. Now, wait a minute. Does the graph really go up forever and ever as X goes to the right forever and ever? I mean, how, how do you even make things go forever and ever? It is in your imagination. Okay, it's I didn't literally draw it to cross the universe and go past the edge of the universe, right? It's in your imagination. But most people can imagine it. Just imagine it going on forever and ever. And yes, it goes up forever and ever without a horizontal asymptote. It gets above any horizontal line as long as you go far enough to the right. And you could experiment with your calculator and graphing windows to see that. You could also write the limit as x goes to minus infinity of x squared is still infinity. That's also, there's a minus sign there now. That's also saying that as x goes to the left forever and ever, the graph still goes up forever and ever without any sort of horizontal asymptote. If I change my example to make the function be x cubed instead of x squared, then the answers, well, at least one of them does change. The graph of x cubed does look different than the graph of x squared. It looks like similar over there, but down over there. And when I say similar, I don't mean exactly the same. They are different graphs. This one's technically a parabola, which has a real technical definition. This side of the x cubed graph is not even a side of a parabola. It doesn't fit the true technical definition of a parabola, which maybe you never even learned about. It's related to light rays and making making telescopes seriously. Um, parabolic mirrors. I'm not going into the details. It is going up forever and ever as X goes to the right forever and ever. It gets above any horizontal line. Therefore, this is still infinity. And you could emphasize it's plus infinity by putting a plus sign. That's that's okay, but you don't have to. But as X goes to the left, excuse me, the left forever and ever, it goes down forever and ever. So that's minus infinity. On the other hand, some functions have horizontal asymptotes. 
what's the limit as x goes to infinity, for example, of, let's do one half to the x. Same as the limit as x goes to infinity of two to the negative x. That's a function whose graph is exponential decay. It looks like this. It does go down. It's decreasing, concave up. And you might say, in a sense, it goes down forever and ever. It never stops going down, but it never gets lower than zero. And in fact, it gets as close as we like to zero by making x big enough. This limit is not infinity. It's not minus infinity. It does exist, and it's zero. I'm not saying this function ever equals zero when I write that. I'm saying it gets arbitrarily close to zero. How big does x need to be to make it within 0.1 of zero? Um, I think it's going to be three something. I don't know, 3.5. Is that good enough? Yep, that's within 0.1. It's, I could actually go a little less than 3.5. How big to be within 0 0.01 of zero? Oh, I don't know, um, maybe eight or something. Yeah, that's good enough. I guess seven might be good enough. Yeah, six point something is good enough. There with it, we're within 0 0.01 of zero. How big to be within 0 0.001 of zero? Maybe 10 is good enough. Yeah, in scientific notation, that's the same as 0 0.00097656. Six, it's less than 0 0.001. If I make the exponent large enough, I can get arbitrarily close to zero. I can get as close to zero as I want without actually equaling zero. 7.8886 times 10 to the negative 31 power microscopic kind of number. Okay, and it can get even more extreme. I approach zero arbitrarily close it, closely, though I never reach it. But that is enough to say the limit is zero. How about logarithms? What's the limit as x goes to infinity of, say, ln of x? What does the graph of ln of x look like? Looks like this increasing and concave down. Looks like maybe it has a horizontal asymptote, right? It's increasing concave down, kind of like this one's decreasing and concave up. Looks can be deceiving though. You would be deceived if you thought it had a horizontal asymptote. This is still infinity, even though this graph grows very, very slowly, it will eventually get above any horizontal line. Question? Yep, yep. Appearances. Yeah, you're right. The main point is appearances can be deceiving. You need some knowledge. For example, how big should x be for ln of x to be bigger than 10? Uh, x should be bigger than e to the 10th. That's how big. e to the 10th is 22,026. How big should x be so that ln is bigger than 100. X should be bigger than e to the 100. How big is e to the 100? On the order of 10 to the 43rd. That's how big X should be before the natural log of that is bigger than 100. This is hinting at a more general argument. <laughs> what about as X goes to zero? but never reaches zero. Can I write that? X goes to zero of ln of X. And I really should emphasize that I'm only plugging positive numbers in for X. That's done by putting a plus sign to the right of the zero. That's an LIM here. LIM, limit as X goes to zero from the right. The graph does go down forever and ever. It's minus infinity. Okay, so this is starting to get you thinking about limits and limit notation. 
in the context where X goes to plus or minus infinity or the output goes to plus or minus infinity. Though with derivatives, we think about limits in other situations where X might be, well, where the function might have a, a hole in its graph, but it still is approaching some number as X approaches some number. We'll talk plenty more about that in the coming weeks, okay? Have a good day.